Hello, and welcome to our November episode of Hingham Happenings. I'm your host, Katherine Collins. Let's take a look at what's coming up in this episode. A Naval Museum at Bear Cove opens its doors to the past. Ken Warkall stops by the library to talk about the role of the honeybee. An annual Back River tour was hosted by State Representative James Murphy. World's End hosts an art opening with a renowned German artist. Heritage means food, beer, and fun at House of Prayer's 31st Oktoberfest. All this and more coming up on Hingham Happenings. An open house was held at the Dock House Museum in Bear Cove Park. Park visitors were welcome to go into the museum to view artifacts, pictures, and memorabilia and learn a little bit about the museum's history as a naval ammunition depot. Today is an open house of the uh, Bear Cove Park. We call it the Greenhouse, the Dock House Museum, which is a uh, museum s supposedly uh, of all artifacts, pictures, and the memorabilia from when this was a naval ammunition depot back in the World War I, World War II, Korea, up until 1962 when it closed down. No, this has been up and running for about, I want to say, eight years now at least. Basically, it's just all set in here as it is, so all I have to do is open the door, turn on the generator, and invite people in. We get new items all the time from people who have worked here, their grandparents, uh, their parents that worked here, and some of them have pictures from back when. And uh, we copy the pictures and we post them on the walls here, as you can see. And there's plenty more pictures that the Navy took in loose leaf folders that you can look through. Scott McMillan has put together a phenomenal, phenomenal history of this place. It's most unusual that all of this material has, has found its way here. And as a former member of the park committee, I am extremely grateful. It's also saved this particular building, what we now call the Green Dock Building. Most people who walk in the park walk past this museum. To have it open from time to time is very, very special. And it also brings to the attention of those who walk here what this place was all about. Most people don't have the faintest idea of what was here. I uh, assist Scott, who's the park ranger here. Uh, he has a lot of photographs and I've been digitizing the photographs. And in the process of digitizing the photographs, I clean them up with Photoshop to remove, you know, whatever defects that I can. And in the past, he would take a 24 by 36 display and individually paced photos or taper. And then we came up with this idea of just doing one sheet. So I now convert all those digital images to one sheet of paper. So it makes it a lot simpler. We realized that if you turn them the opposite way, we would have more wall space. And this is not the biggest room. So you actually get a lot more photographs on the wall. It's amazing to see for the people that just walk by and they come in here and they're amazed. They don't realize what this place was back in the day. Uh, this place supplied a lot of the ammunition for the Atlantic Fleet in World War II. We have a picture of a 5-inch 38 shell. Uh, the Navy did a survey, an underwater survey, off the coast of Normandy in 2002. And they have a picture of a 5-inch shell on the bottom, and you can still read Hingham, Mass. Hingham is a very historic town. And this, since it began in 1917, 
also makes it historic, and it was an important ammunition contributor to World War I, World War II, and a bit of Korea. The museum is open one day per month, and you know Scott is a volunteer as well. He does all this stuff out of his own pocket. We get a little bit in the way of uh, donations, but he's committed to the idea of uh, bringing history to the people that a, worked here, their families and relatives and the town of Hingham and any invited people that come into this area. It's been a monthly commitment to do that, but sometimes we actually have students come in here on days when the museum isn't open or special tours that Scott arranges. They do have meetings here for the Bear Cove Park, which is a totally kind of separate organization that oversees the park in general. So uh, actually the building gets a lot of use and Scott gets involved in all of it. There's a very proud history here as contributing to what we have today in terms of our freedom, our liberty, our military. We owe so much to these people here for the freedoms we enjoy today. Well, it's kind of neat to see them there. Everyone asking, oh, geez, I really didn't realize this was what it was. A lot of them, you know, as they're walking by, they didn't realize it was a Navy base. So they walk by the building all the time and they don't know what's in here. So it's kind of neat, you know, that they see it's open and, uh, and they, they do come in and they're really, uh, really interested in what, what's happened here. Kenneth Warkall made a stop by the Hingham Public Library to share his presentation on the honeybee. Chronicling his many years of experience as a beekeeper, Kenneth expounded upon the importance of the honeybee to mankind. He also provided samples of honey for tasting. We're doing a presentation here this evening on honeybees and our environment and focusing on how important the honeybee is and what's happening to the honeybee and how honeybees have been helping man for hundreds of thousands of years. And also we'll take a look at the inside of a beehive and what's going on in this beehive that allows the honeybees to do their important work of pollination and how they reproduce. One of our reference librarians um, had heard rave reviews about his program from another library that had had him. Um, they sent out an email to just kind of a whole listserv thing that said, you have this guy, he's amazing, it's totally worth it. Um, so she got in touch with him and he was happy to come out and um, we had a great audience. I think it was definitely, definitely worth worth planning. Uh, I spoke at the Athol Library uh, probably two months ago and after that, uh, word got around to all the libraries, and uh, I now have 54 libraries scheduled over the next uh, seven months. Well, I saw the event um, online, and I shared it with my mom, who is also here tonight, and she said she wanted to come because she wanted to learn more about beekeeping as well. And I know Ken, I've seen him at various talks before, and I've met him because I've given a talk at his beekeeping association before. So it was nice to be reacquainted with him as well. There were a couple things that were new. So Ken has been working at Harvard with researchers, so he was able to give input on what their new breaking work is and their research and their data that they're pulling from Harvard. And then I also learned little tidbits that I didn't, I didn't know about personally, um, such as how bees link together to form wax by secreting the wax from their glands. So that was a new thing for, for me to see how they actually do that. There is a massive honey tasting and I got to try cranberry honey, which I've never had before. There's sweet pepper bush honey, clover honey, mint honey, which is delicious. And then Ken is selling his spring harvest, which is like a nice light fragrant honey. And also his fall harvest, which is a little bit more nutty and bolder and very delicious. At the end, he had brought this Candles. I got to help people make candles. He brought all of the wax from the actual beehives and wicks so people could roll up these candles. So I got to help with that. Well, the, the honey bee is important because 40% of all of our food is pollinated by the honey bees. If the honey bee is uh, lost, man will be uh, suffering uh, because there'll be food shortages. And uh, I think as a beekeeper, uh, it's important uh, that we all 
Uh, try to respect the honeybees, not try to kill them out there. Uh, the honeybee is a very docile insect and only will sting to protect its nest and defend its nest. Out there in the field, very docile, it won't, won't uh, bother you at all. And we're losing honeybees at the rate of 30, 40 percent per year. Uh, we can't sustain that and continue that rate and have the honeybee survive, otherwise it will become extinct by the year 2040. I, I've seen the scientific end of it and, and being a beekeeper, I, I know what impact it has. So it's important that we uh, let everybody know that we, we have to fight to keep our honeybees alive and to preserve them for future generations. So I can tell that people in Hingham are really excited about bees just through their attendance, but I think it's really important because they can learn about things that they can do. I mean, you don't need to become a beekeeper to help save the bees. You can become educated and talk to people about it. You can plant flowers that the bees need. They need the nectar, they need the pollen. There's so much that we can learn from them. There's so much that knowledge and there's so much geometry that is in the hive. I'm constantly learning new things. Every time I open the hive and look at the bees, I'm constantly exploring and learning um, just about organization, about hierarchy. Well, you, you can email me at kenwatchell2, K-E-N-W-A-R-C-H-O-L, the number two, at msn.com. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have or anybody has on, on beekeeping. I think it's a topic people are interested in. I think it's a topic that you don't, you can read a lot about, but as far as actually getting to come and talk to an expert, I don't think that there's a lot of that around. I mean, when's the last time you met an expert beekeeper? I don't think that I have ever met one <laughs> until tonight. Um, so I think it's a topic that, again, it's like I said, it's in the news so much, and um, so people are interested. local officials, as well as members of the Department of Conservation, met at the South Shore Yacht Club for their annual Back River Boat Tour. The tour allows the opportunity for these individuals to discuss the preservation of the Back River, as well as find funding for new projects. All aboard! Well, we're being hosted by Representative Rogers and uh, Mayor Hedlund uh, for a tour of the Back River. And this is my first time on the Back River, and I like what I see. It's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful place, flanked by two DCR parks, Abigail Adams and Stoddard's Neck, uh, which are much loved and much used parks as part of the DCR system. We manage about a half a million acres of land uh, for the benefit of all the citizens of, of Massachusetts all over the state and a couple of gems right here in Weymouth and Hingham. So this boat tour is something we've been doing for the last several years. It's an initiative of uh, Rep. Murphy and it's really to highlight um, the potential of this project. The project would be to connect green space on either side of 3A. So there was initially some money in it to, to look at what the potential was for a pedestrian underpass. And so that sort of vision has been created and a design has been proposed. The next step would actually be to, to get some additional money to, to have some as-built drawings built. You know, sometimes that phase is done at the same time as construction. Sometimes, you know, for a project that you don't have the full funding for, initially you could do the as-built drawings, get all the permitting. There'll be some significant permitting involved with this just because it's construction on a river, in a river. So hopefully that will happen, you know, that we take the, the vision that we have and the, and the preliminary plans we have right now and, and get actual permits and as-built drawings and then we'll have accurate pricing and then it's a matter of going back and, and getting the money to actually build. I think this year's tour was amazing. You know, I think it was a, you know, I, I like the part of gathering people in, in the Yacht Club and in the partnership with the Yacht Club and just having that kind of intimate, you know, talk about what we're doing today and, and getting people excited about it. I think the fact that every year we get representatives from both towns at this, this boat trip. And uh, of course this year we had the mayor of Weymouth and we had some local reps, I think, um, it gives people a sense that, hey, we're all in this, we all are supportive of this. So we've done it every year for probably 12 years, you know, um, and due to the partnerships that we have with the Department of Conservation and Recreation and the great people that work there, they provide the boat, 
and they provide the staff. And each year we've done this the same time every year around October. It's a beautiful time of year to, to travel up the back river. So a lot of planning goes into it, but we've done it every year. So it's like on cruise control every year now. We have great people working on this uh, project every year. Well, it's a way to get the towns together along with the state, the different stakeholders, and try to uh, coordinate some of the activities uh, to preserve these resources for future generations. And we, you know, we have uh, the closest ACEC, Area of Critical Environmental Concern, to metropolitan Boston that exists, which is the Back River. So, you know, it ties in with uh, so many recreational uh, and open spaces in the area, whether it's the Harbor Islands, the launch site we have uh, for, for boats uh, and canoes in North Weymouth, um, adjacent to uh, uh, Webb State Park. Uh, it's just a way to kind of link these up and continue that cooperation between the two towns. This is a very congested area in general, and so I think people really you know, benefit from having these spaces where they can just get out and be in nature and be away from their car. And As 3A and this whole area develops more, it just becomes more congested. So this project would really mitigate a lot of that and, and remind people that we live in this beautiful area. Hingham is a town that's already incredibly committed to um, conservation and green space. And I have the benefit of working with the town uh, at Wampatuck and I, I understand their commitment and I feel like this would just be another a resource for the town that you'd be able to all those communities that, that abut Bear Cove that you'll be able to walk from Bear Cove over to the shipyard to go to a movie or to, you know, go to lunch. I mean, that's, that's the stuff that people really want in this world now, you know, walkable spaces and being able to park your car at home and just, you know, really appreciate the beauty that we have all around us here. I think it would be a real benefit for the town of Hingham. It's making those connections that is the, the big vision involved here. It's just a question of when. To see it is to believe in it, and that's why I know this project's going to get done. The Trustees of Reservation hosted an art opening at World's End featuring German artist Jeppe Hein. Jeppe's artwork features the use of many mirrors, reflecting both the amazing landscape and the visitors. The event also featured fun activities that reflected Jeppe's sensibilities. So today we have our big opening of A New End, that's the title of the sculpture behind us. Um, today we have the artist who's in from Germany along with the curator um, who are giving tours throughout the day. Along with that we have activities going on for all of our visitors. Uh, there's an art activity and a yoga class that happened on top of Planters Hill and there'll be some music playing throughout the day to kind of round out what we're doing. There's a ton of planning and preparation that goes into it. Um, a couple months ago I have to run our outline for the day, our staffing plan, and all of our strategy by the police department in Hingham to make sure that they're comfortable with it. The Art and Landscape Initiative has been in the works for the trustees for the last two years. It's been in the works for, it's been an idea for even longer than that, but over the last two years we've started to initiate some of these things. When we got involved in this idea and we were approached by donors about the idea of having public art on our, on our properties, we wanted to make sure we did it right. Trustees is not in the business of collecting artwork, but we did see this as a great opportunity to be relevant and to engage visitors in a new, exciting way. In doing that, we wanted to pick someone who really knew art, and that's where Pedro came in. The trustees hired me to come out and look at their sites. Uh, they have over 100 sites throughout the state, but they asked me to pick, uh, they, they gave me a selection to look at. Among them, World's End. I was immediately struck by the beauty of the place, by the, you can tell that people really love it here, uh, that people come here repeatedly throughout the year. It was these characteristics of, of serenity and spirituality, the, the, the sense of isolation you feel when you're at World's End, even though you're in the middle of the South Shore, is, is very impressive, and it made me think about you know, meditation, it made me think about mindfulness, and, and that led me to, to Yet Behind. The mirror was, of course, in a, in, is quite important here because you have this fantastic area, uh, and I think you can't compete or compare anything with the nature. I think this, this is where we heal, this is where we are from, 
and I thought if you add something which is in the mirror, they're used to this nature, but sometimes we're forgetting actually to look at it, just to look at the small things going on around us. So this mirror actually is just reflecting this surrounding, but you think it's a new big art piece, but it's actually just reflecting where we are right now. Reflecting this beautiful landscape, but also reflecting the city in the background. So you're adopting these things within the whole art piece, but within you. Yepa uses highly polished reflective stainless steel to create these columns. But there's a lot of work that comes into preparing the ground. We had to lay concrete and then his team has this template that they put on the concrete because the angle of each column is very specific to create this reflective surface. And you can see as you walk around it that it's very precise the way it curves. Yepa is a family guy and, and he spends a lot of time with his family and um, I think um, that influences all of us. He likes to have fun and he likes to be engaged. So I think that the activities really reflect who he is. We had our yoga class that kicked off. That was very well received. I was up on top of the hill for a little while and um, there had to be at least 50 people involved in a yoga class. Um, and right from there we started our art activity, which is a, um, a singing bowl uh, art activity where uh, it's in a Tibetan tradition where paint is filled in these bowls and the same way if you rub your finger atop uh, a crystal glass and it makes a vibrating noise, same thing with the singing bowl. When you rub the paint across the top of it, um, the paint inside the bowl then splatters up out of it and lands on a canvas beneath. More people have talked to me in Hingham on World's End after we initiated this sculpture than in the last year that I have been on site. For us, it's any, any public program that we do is really about communicating and sharing the message of con conservation with people. I think people have really personal experiences at World's End. People in Hingham that run every day on the property or that walk every day on the property, hopefully they get a different perspective and it adds to that everyday experience. I think it's a piece that anyone can relate to. To have this here is an opportunity for the, for the community to see sculpture, to see art that they normally would have to drive to Boston or New York or somewhere else to see. This is a magic moment. I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's an artist uh, to be invited for a project in this occasion and be able to, to do an art piece like that. Is of course, uh, what can I say more? It's just a heart opener. As a celebration of the heritage of the Lutheran faith, Oktoberfest is held annually at the House of Prayer Lutheran Church. It is a festival full of food, beer, and fun. Guests fill up on German dishes, desserts, and then dance to the sounds of authentic German music. As they say in German, Prost! <laughs> This is our 31st annual Oktoberfest. I don't know if people know, but the Lutheran Church is based on Martin Luther, and Martin Luther is a German, and that gets us to the Oktoberfest, and we decided to do it as a celebration for our church when we started 31 years ago, but it shows our German heritage. We were celebrating our 20th anniversary, and we said, let's do something for the community. We got a tent, and we set up an Oktoberfest. We had a lot of people show up, and the main question was, it's an Oktoberfest and there's no beer. How come there's no beer? After that Oktoberfest ended, we decided we're gonna have another Oktoberfest. We'll have beer at that one, had beer ever since. And that's kind of the real quick history on the whole thing. There's a lot of planning and preparation. We start in April and we have monthly meetings all the way to, through September. It's uh, very widely known in this area. It's a time for celebration and uh, good times with the folks from this area and even from other areas. This event draws 2,500 people a weekend in the past. We have a silent auction. We have a lot of German meats which are donated from the smokehouse in Norwell, as well as sauerkraut and pumpernickel bread. We have cakes here from Candida Meister in Braintree. We have a children's tent where they're having face painting. We have a bake table, which people of the congregation have been baking all week and have dropped off their items, and uh, that's a big success. The very first time there was an Oktoberfest, it was really just a church picnic, and people had brought things. They decided to have it out on the front lawn. They had a card table with a record player with German music, 
And some people stopped along the way and asked if it was something that they could come to. And so I think they were invited to stay. And at the end, people said, maybe we should do this again. It was really important to rebuild some fellowship within the church. And so people said, well, maybe Oktoberfest is one of those really great ways to do that. That we work together, we plan together, and the proceeds um, go back out into the community. First of all, it's a free event. Although we do take donations for the, uh, the food pantry, that's what we call admission. 60% of the money that's raised here today and tomorrow will be going to outside charities, uh, including Habitat for Humanity, Diana Devana Center, Wellspring and Hull, and the Hingham Food Pantry. One of the parts of our mission statement talks about actively reaching out to help and serve others. And so through Oktoberfest, that happens in a couple ways. One is just offering hospitality. The other part of it is that the proceeds help to support and to fund a number of nonprofits who we see out there doing God's work. Bring together not only the church here, but the whole community to see all the different things going on. They've included different community organizations, and it's a great place to just bring community together and have fun. House of Prayer has been a long time partner with us. They support us with volunteers, they donate to our organization, and we have an annual ride every year that actually starts and finishes here. Our band is King Ludwig's Bavarian Band. We've had them for 30 30 of our 31 years. And so you can come in and sit and just listen to the music all afternoon. You don't have to buy anything. Of course, we do promote that stuff. And once you start smelling the German food over there, I'm sure you'll want it. Our sauerkraut is the, an old family recipe from the Rheimold family. Rheimold is German. And this sauerkraut is the best sauerkraut I have had of all the sauerkrauts around the world. Sausages come from the smokehouse up in Norwell. Uh, the owner of that is a member of the church and he donates them and they are very good. We cook them the way he tells us to cook them so that you get all the flavor out of it. You have to see the desserts. It's the only way they're going to sell. The German chocolate cake, you just start drooling when you see the thing. But I hope that people take away that it is a wonderful event for the community to get together. A lot of people see their neighbors here and a lot of people were drawing from communities all around this area so it, it's, it's a good outreach. I really just love of seeing people come and enjoy themselves. You know, some people just kind of park themselves at a table with maybe with their stein and they just enjoy the music. People are out on the dance floor, little kids are out on the dance floor with their parents or grandparents. And it's just a delight to see all of that. We have some crafters who come so people can engage with them and sometimes find just the right thing to take home with them. It's a joy. You get to see me in Lederhose and what more do you want? <laughs>